Hi guys, welcome back to another video. I hope you enjoyed the last one. Now, today, I was planning to give you part two of my video, undisclosed evidence, burned by the a potential murder book, suspect, uh, as the title says, but unfortunately, I can't. So, I'm just gonna jump straight in and explain to you why. Now, you may be aware that Bernard Mahoney has a website. Now, it's only accessible via the Wayback Machine, which is a page which allows you to view ancient websites, basically. Now, this website is Bernard's own way of bigging himself up and trying desperately to appear like a real gangster. The site contains unrelated bullshit, including recordings of phone calls between him and Reggie Cray. <laughs> You can literally picture Bernard licking his arsehole so badly, which is apparent in some of the recordings. And Bernard just basically being a Joey mug, doing the favours for Reggie whilst he was banged up. Uh, he also puts on this pathetic little voice when he speaks to Reggie, which I just found fucking hilarious. Um, but the site also contains a truckload of material regarding the Essex Boys case and has been very useful for the channel for obvious reasons. And it's the website, ironically, uh, that contained the information about Bernard being a potential murder suspect, which I used in my video in the first place. But since yesterday, it appears that Bernard has very hastily removed this specific content. Now, I wonder why. Can you see where I'm going with this, guys? He has clearly had a temper tantrum and once again proves his desire to be the main man when it comes to Essex Boy's case. I mean, what a pathetic little man. Now, it could be one of a few reasons why it was removed. Now, to start off with, like I mentioned, he wants to be in charge of anything Essex Boy's related. And like a little child, he can't live with himself to think of somebody other than himself having any sort of spotlight or opinion on the subject. Uh, another reason is, you know, he can't live with himself to think of anybody other than himself earning any money around the Essex Boys case. And I must add that I create this channel for reasons other than making money. I can't make money off this YouTube channel anyway, as it's not a monetized channel. I created the channel because a while back, it must be, what, about six months ago, Crime Scene to Courtroom channel was experiencing grief. Um, and I believe from the same source, Bernard. Now, if you're interested in the Essex Boys case and you've not yet seen the channel, like I said, it's Crime Scene 2 Courtroom, number two, but I'll put uh, a link in the description. I strongly suggest, if you follow the case or are interested in the case, I strongly suggest you head over there to, the, to that channel, because quite frankly, there's some really outstanding content which has clearly been achieved by a lot of hard work, patience and effort. But anyway, back to where I was. Uh, I've been interested in the case since childhood, um, and I live in Colchester, which is not very far. Um, from Rettendon, not very far at all, about 18 miles or so. Um, and literally, Mark's Tay, which is the place where Darren Nichols alleges he met Mickey Steele on the night of the murders, um, it's just about a mile out of Colchester. Um, so I've followed, you know, I've followed the case for a long time. Um, um, but I was going to explain, uh, about six months ago, most of the channel's content, Crime Scenes Courtroom's content, went down, and I was afraid it was going to be closed down permanently, and I wanted to follow, you know, follow in his footsteps and keep the content coming for all of those that are interested. So that's, you know, um, another reason that, you know, I started the channel. Fortunately, the channel was not closed down, that's Crime Scenes Courtroom's, but I am very interested in the case, so I decided to keep the channel going. Um, that's this this channel. 
So in a nutshell, I had no intention of making any money. I wanted to keep the Essex Boys story alive and share as much content as I could. Obviously, Bernard O'Mahony has seen it as a threat, hence the potential reason he removed the content. But another very likely version uh, is that Bernard O'Mahony is upset because the video I made yesterday uh, and the one I had lined up for today revealed him as a potential murder suspect. <laughs> now, the thick twat, if that is the case, shouldn't have put it on his own goddamn website if he was worried about people learning some, some more detailed truths regarding him and the case. I mean, come on. Surely he's not that thick. I mean, we all know, you know, he wrote a few books. <coughs> um, uh, well, actually, I doubt very much that he wrote them, as opposed to having his name slammed on the cover. But anyway, um, if he is that thick, then I generally feel sorry for him. But hey-ho, life goes on. Unless you blasted point blank from a pump-action shotgun, that is. But I would imagine it's most likely what I mentioned before. He imagines or thinks I could be earning money from the case, and that's too much for him to handle. Thanks a lot, Bernard. Anyway, I'll continue this video by telling you some of the key facts I remember from the second part of the content, uh, which has, like I explained, now disappeared. Bernard O'Mahony claims he went to the crime scene a few weeks later and found a spent blue shotgun cartridge in Workhouse Lane, which he picked up and threw into a field. He then contacted the old Bill immediately to tell them what had happened and explain why a matching cartridge to those used in the murders, down to the same brand and manufacturer's marks, may now have his fingerprints on. By this pretty strange, you know, now this is pretty strange, um, Bernard visited the crime scene on many occasions in the year after the killings, but then claimed he hardly knew the area and had only been there once. Bernard had a very special relationship with the police and as mentioned in the first video was overlooked on too many occasions where he should have been questioned. There was also more examples of half-truths and lies which he gave to the media and police and then stupidly contradicted himself in his books. But in a nutshell, it explains that Bernard O'Mahony was dealt with in an extremely strange and lenient way. What do you think? Let me know in the comments and I'll know, you know, I'll now, I'll now let you know what I think regarding Bernard O'Mahony and the case. Now, this case is unique and unusual in a number of ways. For example, the almost endless possibilities of what could have happened and who could have done it is fucking crazy. I've never known a case in the UK like it. And obviously, I wasn't there that night, but let's just go over a few points regarding O'Mahony. The man had a history of violence, <clears throat> he had a history of weapon offences, he was an ex-soldier who was experienced in handling semi and full automatic weapons, he was experienced in handling shotguns, he was singled out as a grass by Tucker in the weeks leading up to the murder, he was given unprecedented leniency from the police whilst they conducted the murder investigation. He went out of his way to be as involved in the case with the media and the public giving interviews, telling stories, anything he could possibly do to involve himself with the story. He'd done it. Now, you know, if you knew about the Ian Huntley case, um, this is uh, a tragic case of the murder of two young schoolgirls years ago in the UK. Um, now, Ian Huntley, you know, spoke to the spoke to the press, you know, wanted to be, he was involved in searching for the, for the two girls who he'd actually murdered, um, and people who have got something to do with it, um, you know, something to do with a crime, can very often self-associate themselves with the media, with the police, with, with efforts to, to find that person, um, and that's, you know, very much what Bernard has done in this case and also in some regards in the, the Leah Betts case as well. Now, he could be a potential murder suspect for just one of these examples, but strangely, he never was. Uh, does this mean I think he killed them or had anything to do with the murders? Well, yes, quite frankly. From all the given facts, I believe that he could damn well have had something to do with the murders from having the potential to pull the trigger himself 
to being part of the organisation to the actual fucking murders. Now, I think the facts he was never the, uh, the fact that he was never investigated properly. This cast a huge element of doubt on his character and his words. Did he have a motive? Yeah, just as much as many others. His life and the safety of his family had been threatened by Tucker and Tate, and I think that alone is reason enough to at least fucking interview the mug. Anyway, I was not there that evening, and it's likely we may never know what happened that night. But to completely write off O'Mahony as a suspect would be ridiculous. I'm not saying I think categorically he done it. I'm just saying these facts, they're just odd, you know? I mean, what's also ridiculous is the fact that you guys were unable to hear the proper second half of this video. But please don't blame me, blame O'Mahony. Now, two things before I finish up. Firstly, if Crime Scene to Courtroom is watching this, I would love to reach out to you in some way to discuss properly the problems you had earlier in the year with Bernard. If you'd be happy to contact me for a chat, I'll leave my email and um, you know a link in the description. Secondly, as I was unable to provide you with the content I wanted, um, I'm also going to post on the channel today a track I created uh, based on the film Rise of the Foot Soldier. Now. I was just having a laugh. Uh, I created, I, I create and produce music in my spare time uh, for a bit of fun. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy it. By the way, it's not suitable for young young'uns. Um, and if you haven't seen the new Rise of the Foot Soldier film yet, spoiler alert, it's fucking wank. It is such I, I could do a whole video on how shit that film is now the whole rise of the foot soldier other than the first one i love the first one but the rest of them are just a load of wank in my eyes now this one i was actually looking forward to it's the first one i was actually you know looking forward to going to the cinema looking forward to going to watch it i was thinking that based on all of the the, the publicity which the the, the the, the films that have been made regarding the Essex Boys, including Bonded by Blood, uh, the actual film The Essex Boys, etc. These these films have generated so much more um, so much more hype around the case and so much more awareness of the case. Um, and you know that you know I was hoping that because of these reasons they would you know put so much of the actual truths of the case into the film and that's just not the case i mean it's just i'm not going to explain it you, you know see it yourself if you want to but it's just really really poor film um i'd like to say there's there's more than two or three funny things or decent fight scenes but that's not even the case either and also the fact that uh omahoney oh was played by vinnie jones you know, oh my God, here we go. But I'm not even going to go down that road. Anyway, look, um, thanks for watching as always, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Stay tuned and stay safe. And don't forget to check out the, uh, the track I put up. Cheers, guys.